All right, everybody, welcome back to Praetor Magic. My name is DM Cross, and this is our Monday live podcast called Reflections of the Council. I'm joined, as always, by our friends Magical Hacker and Frexman Walker. So how are you guys doing tonight? Doing great. A little uh, sick, but the show must go on. Well, you're sick because of your own fault. Yeah, it my like. cho- I made my own choices, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> not the contagious type of sick. That's for sure. I don't know. Bad choices nowadays seem contagious. But on that note, Frexine, how <laughs> how are you? I'm doing well. Just you know, went back to school today. You know, back to teaching. Had a nice oh, you know, oh, yeah, five yeah. six day break, and then had to go back to my loving students. When you said back to school, I was like, "Oh man, you're back in classes." I didn't know you were still doing college. And then I'm like, "Oh, that's right. You're you're the other side of the fence for me." Because when I go yeah. back to class, I go back to being taught, supposedly. <laughs> But tonight, uh, we have an interesting topic. It's a little after Thanksgiving now, and ironically, our topic has nothing to do with that. Uh, however, what we do have is an interesting kind of threat assessment. And we've talked about threat assessment on this podcast before, maybe not as the holistic topic, but we've always kind of branched into it a little bit because it's a big topic to debate when it comes to multiplayer magical gathering because everybody always feels like, their threat assessment is better than whatever is being used to blow up their stuff, right? right? And the threat assessment that we want to talk about in this particular instance is before the game even starts, before your hand's drawn, before you draw your first card for the game, before you put down your first land. And, of course, the only thing that you know at that point is the commander. So mm-hmm. as the game starts, everybody's sitting down, everybody's flipping over the commander to show what it is. There are certain assumptions that you can kind of make based on what everybody is playing. If somebody sits down, and one example that I'm going to use tonight is going to be uh, Brago, King Eternal. If you see that flip over, you kind of get that, ah, crap, here we go. Somebody's trying to control the board, basically make it impossible for me to do anything in the game. And you'll have those players who do flip over Brago and try to turn around and be like, oh, it's not that kind of deck. This is my own kind of janky spin on it, blah, blah, blah. And you kind of have to have that those few awkward moments while they're doing setup. Like, do you give them a pass? You know, they're just mm-hmm. having their janky build, quote unquote. Or do you want to kill them because if they're not either not being completely honest or they just happen to have the right cards to do what Brago does, which is kind of lock out the game a little bit, it's going to be miserable for you and you're going to miss your opportunity. So that's kind of what we're talking about here is... is Threat assessment of commanders, even when they're potentially brewed in the non usual in an unusual way. Is that the right? Am I saying this yeah. right, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like I had a more threat assessment in general because who can resist? Yeah, I feel like I had a much better way to try to bring this point across, and I lost it somewhere. But so, what about you guys? Because I know again, my my example is Brago King Eternal because I built a Brago deck that wasn't a usual Brago deck. I had maybe like five of the usual quote unquote control pieces, and then everything was Enter the Battlefield effects because I fell in love with the like Wing Splicer cards, which uh, they make golems and then they give golems. Oop, never mind. I don't know how to spell a card. There you go, Wing Splicer, not Winged. So they make these 3-3 golden artifacts when they enter the battlefield, and then they have a passive ability which gives the golden creatures some kind of ability, Wing Splicer, and in this case being flying. So I basically just made a token deck where I had all the Splicers in there, and then like Geist Sonder Monk and a few other things, and I just wanted to do White Blue enter the battlefield tokens where if Brago got through, I'd bounce all my token makers and then make more tokens, and that, that was, the, was the whole plan. Um, again, I had like five or six of the actual like regular control pieces. Enter the battlefield, uh, you know, tap people stuff or exile people stuff kind of stuff that Brago typically runs. But even saying that and trying to express that to people, I would get targeted very early on in the game. People would still try to kill Brago first, counter Brago, not let me get down any kind of like ramp pieces or anything like that. So have you guys had experiences where you guys were the, com- uh, the pilot of a deck like that? Well, first I'll say you deserve it. <laughs> I've played 3DH Brago twice on stream, and the first time was on your stream, and Brago got permanently exiled. I still won with Dead Eye Navigator playing fake Brago, and then the second time I had five lands on Jeremy's stream and still managed to win, just flickering Brago stuff and making to- tokens. That's all I was trying to do too, was flickering stuff for tokens removal, 
And mm. you know what? Braga just deserves to be targeted no matter what. He's just too powerful. But that's removal. Even if you're doing something janky with him. No, no, you said flickering token and removal. The removal parts are the Brago parts, like the legit Brago parts. Well, I'm talking about like duplicate and uh, yeah. primordial and stuff like that. That's yeah. not you. Brago is usually stacks. Yeah. And I don't have a single combo. stacks card Throw in my in. entire Brago deck. Yeah. I'm talking about the bad like six and seven drop removal spells, Spine of Isha and stuff like that. Spine of Isha goes in a lot of Brago decks, granted, but. Um, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, it's a big difference between someone playing like the Strionic Resonator package in Brago, and when they're playing stuff like Exclusion Ritual in their in their Brago deck. It's a big like difference between those two types of builds. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure you named a whole bunch of cards that you would find on EDHREC.com for Brago. I'm just saying. I'm pretty sure you find a lot of those token generators on for Brago too. Probably. <laughs> Uh, I bet you can find all of them. I bet you can find every single card you named to generate tokens right. on EDH Rec for Braga. Well, I'm gonna look because I didn't. Well, so I didn't use EDH Rec when I built mine. Again, I came pretty much because I got a whole bunch of the splicers in whatever master set they came in, and uh, mm-hmm. I built it be- mainly because of that. So I, I didn't even use EDH Rec. I just basically used Scryfall and looked for white and blue cards that said "Enter the battlefield tokens." And went from there. With a few yeah. of my own personal favorites, like uh, I did put like Kefnet's Monument on there. Chris is saying that's a Modern Master 17. Okay. I put like Kefnet's Monument in there, but that was more to make Brago cost less. And then I realized, no, <laughs> this is actually disgusting in pretty much any deck where you play a lot of creatures. That's an interesting comment too. A little bit ago, said there's a reason why my 3DH Gen dies tribal deck is Sekiar and not Prosh. Yeah. So he's just trying not to take the hate that a Prosh deck would bring. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say um, one that I built that a lot of people like. I built just for 3DH, and a lot of people are assuming that uh, I was using it for the combos and everything else was Brea. And I was really just building Brea for uh, Brea Thopter Tribal. And that's all I was doing was trying to make a bunch of Thopters. And I literally had the things that, you know, when they entered a battlefield, make a Thopter, just like Brea enters the battlefield and makes Thopters. So I was just mm-hmm. trying to make Thopters, as many Thopters as I could, put some stuff out with some good removal and interaction in there. But, like, people were expecting me, like, because Paradox Engine was in budget. So they were expecting me to be running Paradox Engine. Paradox Engine wasn't in the deck. Like... Mm-hmm. They're expecting me to be trying to like cram the Thopter Foundry or whatever it is, Sword of the uh, Meek. Assembly? Yeah, Thopter, Thopter assembly. assembly and Sword of the Meek or whatever that is. They were expecting mm-hmm. me to try to cram that combo in because it was in budget, quote unquote, but it would have been mm-hmm. a lot of the budget. So they're expecting me to be playing stuff like that. And I'm like, no, I'm really just trying to make a bunch of Thopters. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have any combos. I don't have any ways to really abuse it. I'm like, I'm just trying to make a bunch of them. And yeah, every now and again, I'm going to use her abilities because they're great abilities. But mm-hmm. did you have just the... making Thopters and trying to hit you to death with Thopters. Did you have the white, the void Eldrazi that I can't remember what it was called? Uh, Eldrazi Displacer? Yeah. Nope. Didn't have that in there either. <laughs> that one was too expensive, I'm pretty sure, at the time. I don't know what it is now in season three, but it was too expensive okay. at the time. I, I didn't look at putting that in there. If you had that one, it's kind of like, eh, are you really though? Because I don't, I don't think Ashton's altar was typically, or has Ashton's altar ever been in budget? I don't think so. No. But if Part it was, Iron works is now. Yeah. So you could kind of do stuff with it. Yeah. So I, I had a question for you guys, if that's okay. No. Uh, you're no. <laughs> denied. You're moving on. Okay. <laughs> with with both of your examples, it kind of feels like the janky build is always represented by some type of tribal deck, right? So for you, Seth, it was Golem Tribal, where you had a bunch of splicers and you're trying to do Golem Tribal with Brago. You know, maybe you weren't playing like Obelisk of Erd and like other tribal mainstays, but the oh, idea was. was you were you were. I was playing Obelisk of Erd and Coat of Arms and the Favorable Wind. For the Thopter Tribal, yeah. yeah, yeah. For my Thopter Tribal, I was playing all that. Um, do you think that if someone says, I'm not 
you know, I'm not playing the optimum build for this commander, but at the same time, I'm not playing a tribal deck. Do you think that it's more along the lines of closer to optimize or is it closer to like the janky version? And I can give an example here because yeah. this is the only time that I personally felt like um, my deck was less powerful because my commander was so known to be powerful, even though the deck itself was built differently than maybe a lot of other people built it. So I used to have a Queen Marchesa deck, and uh, people really like playing Which her for one? Queen uh, the Mardu one. The Mardu, the Mardu one. one. Okay. Um, people Mardu. like playing her usually for like a control deck, and then you got the Monarch to get yourself some value. You can make some of the Assassins if you need to. Uh, which are great blockers. So the, it's a lot. Usually, it's like a Mardu control deck. But what I wanted to do with it was like goad tribal. So it's not really a tribal deck, but the idea was to like pillow fort, but also to pump up all the creatures on the battlefield for my opponents, so that they wanted to hit each other uh, with all sorts of different effects, uh, but they couldn't really hit me as effectively. So one of the cards I really enjoyed playing in the deck. Uh, was Season of the Witch, which is a super old card. It's from the dark. And the only version that it, you know, that you can find as a picture is going to have like horribly <laughs> outdated <laughs> text. So it says, at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice Season of the Witch unless you pay two life. So that's one of the abilities. The other ability says, at the beginning of the end step, destroy all untapped creatures that didn't attack this turn except for creatures that couldn't attack. So it basically gave you an option. You can attack with your creature or it will destroy it. So uh, it made people want to attack each other. And so when you combine uh, that with stuff like um, uh, Farsight Mask or Ghostly Prison or maybe Seth's favorite card, uh, Sphere of Safety, Some the of idea them. was <laughs> the, <laughs> the idea was that people wanted to attack each other. But every time I played that deck, when people saw that it was Queen Marchesa, just the commander itself made people want to take me out first, even though I was playing more of like a group hug style deck than, you know, the, the optimized version. Uh, and then from that point on, I said, you know what? If I ignore threat assessment uh, before the game begins, right? If I ignore it during my deck building, it's going to show in my games. So now I think of threat assessment not just as something that happens in the games. It also happens in the deck building, you know? Yeah. Okay. It even happens yeah, just in a... Like uh, said, right? That yeah. he doesn't play Prosh. He plays Sekyar, even though he mm -hmm. Prosh was probably better for the Jund dies tribal deck. Yeah. Having a sack out in the command zone, pretty powerful. What are you saying, DM? Sorry, I think I cut you off a little bit. Well, I was just saying that the, uh, the threat assessment can even go outside of just what decks are being played and even be a matter of the players at the table. Especially in a big community like what we have, where we have like anywhere from 10 regular people to like you know way more than that every once in a while you'll see people that haven't played for a long time or whatever like uh alex the other day started popping in the streams and he was like one of the original players way back last year and that the third assessment of who's at the table is sometimes a thing as well like frexine no matter what you're playing i assume that you're going to be a stronger player at the table it doesn't matter if you're playing a bad commander, a really strong commander, I assume that you're going to know what you're doing as you pilot, as opposed to maybe somebody I don't really have a lot of experience with, where I kind of have to judge what they're doing as the game goes on, because they could be new, a new player to the format, or even a new player to uh, Magic in general. So, if they're making a lot of mistakes or whatever, then, not that I disregard them, but I maybe don't worry as much or don't expect as much from them Whereas you, I again, will be a little bit more leery of. <laughs> then of course, like, that commander doesn't seem as good as the normal commanders you bring, but something's gonna happen. Yeah, then I just assume there's some like specific, uh, what am I thinking? Uh, interaction or like combo, whether it's infinite or not, like some kind of synergy in there that you really like or whatever, or. We could have magical hackers sit at the table and if it in combo at us <laughs> all night yeah. long. I, which is I, pretty I much, still I, I just want you to know that's pretty much my expectation now. If you sit <laughs> down, I pretty much assume that you're going to accidentally Unesh all over my face, even if Unesh isn't your commander. Doesn't matter. Uh, you can be playing mono white, you're gonna I, find a way to do infinite <laughs> combo all over my face. 
I still stand Twice. behind the fact that it's not truly infinite. <laughs> it was a storm like synergy, you know, interaction. It wasn't a combo per Did se. Did you loop it until you won? <laughs> Uh, I didn't have anything to loop. That's the thing. <laughs> what are you no, talking it, about? You in, won in, the in, game all, in all seriousness, I understand. You know, when when you're sitting down at a table who has you know a 100% win rate on stream, it's gonna be a little intimidating. Uh, that's that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, weird flex, but okay. 100% uh, win rate on stream. You know, yeah, casually I said out say, loud. <laughs> you haven't been tested till you've played a stream with me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I would love to to join in a stream for sure, um, but we'll see we'll see how the future plays out. Uh, I was gonna to talk about something. Esper Derek here said you have to think about the level of hate your commander is going to bring if you're not making a standard deck. And while I think that's absolutely true, I actually think it kind of goes a little further. And I, I want to see if you guys agree with me on this. Even if you are building a standard deck, so let's say you're playing Angry Omnath, right, and you're playing the like best version of him sometimes that's going to be more of a liability than an asset you know choosing to play a, a commander that people know is going to be strong oftentimes means that you have a lower win rate because of how popular that commander is so i've noticed for myself at least that if i choose an underplayed commander there is like a lot more breathing room that i have at the table in order to get set up in order to do awesome things Whereas if I pick something that's super played, like uh, Atraxa or uh, Oloro or Yidris, you know, it's going to be very difficult, almost impossible for me to even get rolling because of how people, uh, uh, rightly so, I think, in my opinion, they use a threat assessment and say, okay, this person cannot stay at the table for too long because if they do, highly, ch it's a high chance that they're going to win. I think I think some of that is also that, like, you, you name Omnis is a aggro a very aggro yeah. commander. Once he gets mm -hmm. out, if he sticks, it's probably going to be bad. Yeah. yeah. Um, some of the other ones you mentioned, though, like Aloro, is just, again, that one makes it hard to aggro out because of what Aloro does. Just from turn right, one, right. you're getting value. So some of those examples, I think, are a little bit more weighted toward, like, you kind of have to be more careful for them because they have basically either a turning point on the thinning field, or you're behind from the beginning of the game, which is a Loro. Because from again turn one, you're that person is going to be higher up than everybody. I, I don't yeah. think I don't think there's any or too many turn one plays that can get you two life. No, no, not that I, not that I know of. Without without especially without having to do anything. There's no things other than a Loro that at the beginning of your turn you're just higher than everybody. The closest thing I can think of is Sun Droplet. You know, well, yeah, but um, maybe the that, Soul Sisters. But even that, like, Alora is just untap, yeah, upkeep, for boom, free. It's there. Yeah, yeah. Un untap, upkeep. There you go. Yeah. I just got before two you even draw your first card. Yeah, before I've even played a card. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that I think freaks people out as well. Is so that having the edge from the beginning and having no way to interact with it? Yeah. So, uh, but well, you said a third one too. It was on this. Yeah, I, I mentioned uh, Atraxa, Yidris as well. Marin's another great example, though. You know? Yeah. Really, if you look at like the top played commanders, the closer you are to the top, the more people tend to be afraid of the deck. You know? I mean, how many of us have lost to an Atraxa Super Friends deck and we felt like there's nothing that we can do because maybe we're not playing a creature based deck or we're not and playing a lot of aggro stuff? And, and even I then, think you hit right on it right there is yeah. how many of us have played it, mm -hmm. right? It's because of their popularity that you've sat down across the table and you've played the deck and you've seen someone go off with it. And you've seen what that deck can do, quote unquote. And so then you expect it. So like if I sit down with my Prosh deck because somebody else is playing Prosh in season three with Food Chain, you're going to be like, oh, wait, oh. He, he's, he's playing Prosh. He must have yeah. Food Chain. And my mm -hmm. Prosh deck doesn't run Food Chain. It chooses to run Skull Clamp instead of Food Chain. Um, but, um, you know, for budget constraints in 3DH. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, that, that's, I think that, that you hit on it right there is the fact that those popular commanders have been seen so many times that people know what they can do because they've actually seen it and they've sat down and see it. Whereas if you play something, you know, more quote-unquote innocuous, 
they aren't as leery of it just because they haven't seen the broken thing that it can do. Like, for example, War the Raid Mother. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Is a very broken commander, but is not overly popular. So people don't really know what work can do. But the other day, I was gold fishing my work deck, and I broke the token limit on turn six with a three DH work work deck. Wow. On turn six, I broke the token <laughs> limit. Now, granted. No interaction, so I was able to get Ward out on turn four and stayed out for the two turns for me to do that. But I broke the token limit on MTGO on turn six with that commander. But most people wow. wouldn't be as afraid of Wart as Prosh, but in a lot of ways, Wart can be scarier than Prosh. Um, yep. If it's allowed to just sit there and get going. But people yep. leave it alone. They see Prosh and they're like, oh, I gotta deal with that Prosh deck. And they see yeah. Wart and they don't realize until they've seen it a time or two and then they're like oh wait no that that's scary let's not let's not let that happen again we got to kill that when it enters the battlefield you know so yeah from a uh, opponent perspective because there's a couple different perspectives that we could talk about we could talk about the opponent we could talk about uh maybe even still being the opponent but trying to like advise as an advisor i guess would be the second perspective to somebody who's trying to build these decks who's maybe new to the format and doesn't understand where the inbred hate comes from, or even from being a pilot. But for right now, as an opponent, with somebody who's sitting down saying, I want to play war, but I, it's not, quote-unquote, that kind of war deck, what do you do? Do you kill them anyway? Because well, at the end of the day, everybody's going to die. Huh? I said every war deck is that kind of war deck, because every war deck just you know doubles all their spells. Well, I mean, like... It doesn't have to be a war deck that like runs away with off. Yeah. Yeah. Like doubling your cultivates and stuff is you know, it's it's dangerous because you're ramping up, but it's not doubling your bane fires where X is twenty. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, yeah. So as as the opponent to this, do you kill them anyway? Because at the end of the day you're gonna try to kill them anyway. But do you hate honestly, on them first? Do you honestly watch what they're doing? Do you just remove their commander? Do you old counters? And then what if you're not a control deck? You know what I mean? So Yeah, I mean, for me personally, if I see someone that sits down to the table and they've got, for example, Xur in their command zone, um, they might be telling me, you know, this is not the Doomsday version. This is not the Voltron version. But for me personally, if I see Xur, they just have a lot more power in their command zone. They have a much more powerful card in their command zone because of, and, and I know this because of how popular Xur is. And so because of that, sure, they might be not doing the crazy thing, but even without doing the crazy thing, they still have a crazy commander, if that makes sense. And so in my mind, um, I think it's completely you know justified to look at the game and maybe if it's a friend, you might say, okay, I know that they're not playing something crazy. They never played that strong of a deck. Maybe I'll give them a pass this one time. But especially if you're sitting down with a stranger, they might tell you all day long that's not the strongest version. But people have different levels of what is the strongest version in their mind, right? Someone says, well, I'm not running CDH, so my deck sucks. I've heard people say that all the time. People say, oh, my deck is weak because it's not CDH. And it's like the type of deck that, you know, Turn eight comes around, they've got an infinite combo on the board because they used five tutors and all this fast mana. And, you know, they have all these different things that are like CEDH like. Yeah, so Esper Derek here saying Zerg grabbing Necropotence is stupidly strong, even if you're doing literally nothing other bro nothing other broken with Zerg. And so because of things like that, if I see a strong commander, I uh, not only do I say, okay, I'm attacking you because this commander is strong, I also kind of use my political influence because. I know that if we leave a strong commander to do its thing and we don't really uh, deal damage to it, we don't really you know, deal with their permanence, it's going to go off and it's going to win the game. So I also encourage my other opponents to say, okay, look, there's a Prosh deck at the table. You realize I'm playing, uh, I don't know, uh, Council of Orzova, right? I'm, I'm playing the Ghost <laughs> Council. I'm not playing anything strong. Look at that Prosh deck over there. It's the one that's the threat. So even if they're playing, you know, Kobold Tribal, you know, it, it doesn't really matter in my mind as much because the commander itself has that potential to be so strong, even for a weaker strategy. What do you think, Frixine? Would you say it's okay for someone to to look at the commander more than at what somebody's saying? Oh, this deck's not that not that powerful. 
I mean, I'm always going to consider the commander they're playing and what it's capable of, even if they say, <laughs> I've, I'm not, I don't build it optimized, like I don't have it optimized. Because like what you're saying, there can be, like a non-optimized prospect that doesn't run food chain can still be very scary just because you aren't running food chain, a couple of the cards that make it, you know, super good. Maybe you're still running Perforos and yeah, then yeah. you're still dealing 14 damage the first time Prosh hits the field with Perforos in play. So, and then, mm -hmm, you yeah. know, increasingly more damage every other time Prosh hits yeah. the field. So yeah. you, you're still going to kill the table very quickly with like, even Absolutely. the mini combos like that that aren't considered to be competitive, but are still very good. Um, so yeah, you've you've get, definitely got to be aware of what the commander is still capable of, even in the constraints. I would say, or like, I mean, Voltron commanders. I feel mm -hmm. like they they get the bad rap a lot of times, and they can be easy to deal with. Like, you're all probably being the least so since he has hex proof, but mm -hmm. even then, I think like, of Sigarda. Sigarda is so tough to deal with. You know? Yeah, which one? So like the, the host of herons, right? Yeah, yeah, Sigarda host of uh, herons. Um, but I, we're we're making we're making DM work really hard to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because I, I don't typically think of. Oh, I guess because she has hexproof. I, yeah. I was thinking like. I guess I forgot she had hexproof because I was like, I mean, the not sacrifice thing makes her kind of good as a Voltron because then it's harder mm -hmm. to deal with her, and then green and white just had ways of protecting her. So yeah, I was like, all the totem armor Voltron? on there. But yeah, she she has hexproof too, and then means that gets around the fact like with your old, he's still susceptible to like the sacrifice thing. So you run Sigarda and you run um, Juro Preserver and stuff like that in your your old deck to protect him. But with Sigarda, she just says, hey. I'm going to hang out here. I'm good. I already have flying. I'm already a 5-5. Five five. I've got hexproof, and I'm going to put a few things on me and start beating your face in. Um, so good thing you ran that all good. is dust, but it doesn't do anything. Yeah. All is dust does not do anything against Sigarda. Yeah. So you're pretty much left with board wipes against Sigarda, and yeah. that's it. Wasting Destruction a board wipe. Wipes, to... yeah. yeah, kill one creature. Or minus one. Yeah, and it's a lot of minus ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So do you are are you saying then that you kill the strong commander player? Ruxin? I think you kind of have to. I mean, a lot of times you have to at least target them and control what they're doing and control their board state and be very aware of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um and Everybody's... like I said, it's like it's like with a Voltron commander where it's like, yeah, they haven't done much yet. But they're going to get time. their hero in play, and they're going to be able to do 13 damage to one person on one swing, and then on the next swing, someone's dead. Both so like commanders games, are... Uh... Oh, sorry. I've had games where that's happened, and I've been sitting there, I've like kind of been ignoring them because they're having a slow start, and then they come and they start swinging at me, and I'm like, oh crap, now I have to like kill them or deal with their stuff immediately, or I'm just dead. Um, yeah. So, um... I'm going to bring up a point based on one of your points, and then I'm going to say a couple things from the chat because there's a few interesting comments in there. Uh, Voltron commanders bring up an interesting point as far as controlling the board because they're, I think, easier to disrupt because really if you counter or board wipe Sigarda once, you're, you're sending them back a lot as opposed mm -hmm. to like other decks that their threats are more versatile. Right, mm -hmm. so I don't need to rely on this one card to get me through. I just I have so many other answers, or so many other possibilities, or avenues where I can go down. So if Sigarda comes on the battlefield on turn four, let's say, even though she's a five drop, ramped up or mana rock or whatever, right, gets board wiped, and then it takes two turns to cast her, or even another turn to cast her, and she doesn't come with haste or whatever, or let's say you remove the boots or or something, that almost makes it. Like, that kind of threat assessment against a Voltron commander is almost easier to do because you can set them back and then not ignore them permanently, but kind of ignore them for a little while because you've mm. done what you needed to do to put them back in line with, like, the rest of the table. But then you also have to also, in a social game where you're playing with your friends anyway, you have to kind of also worry about making somebody just completely miserable where you could potentially be sending them back far or too far to where they can't get back in the game and then they're just kind of salty that they sit there and do nothing because all they did was play a commander that they like you know what i mean yeah, yeah. imagine that cigar player gets stuck on lands or something or gets killed 
in the next couple of turns, then it's like, oh well, I didn't I didn't get to do anything. You know what I mean? Now yeah. I'm the big jerk I, where I'll be like, oh, I don't really care because you're my opponent. But I I recognize that most people don't think that way. Yeah. I mean, I, at the same time, though, just because someone enjoys something, like let's say they enjoy a particular commander, they might look at Marin, uh, cl- you know, Clan of Neltoth. They say, oh, this looks so beautiful. I want to play this so badly. Uh, just because someone likes something doesn't mean that we should allow them to get away with making bad decisions, right? If someone doesn't play any <laughs> removal in their whole deck, right, we d- we don't say, well, I should let them win so that they can actually have some fun too. Yeah. So if someone's playing the scary commander, I think it's it's fair to say this is w- this is what happens when you choose a commander that has such a big, infamous reputation, at least in my mind. And I... I have friends, and I'll 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 be lenient. I'm not like like a stickler about this or anything, but uh, at least when it comes to myself, and when it comes to someone who asks me for advice, if it's a new player, I say find a commander that many people aren't playing. That's like the easiest way to start winning in commander because you won't get that uh, that threat assessment from the beginning of the game. And on top of that, because there are so many people that will play Atraxa and Brea and Yidris and everybody else you can always say i'm just a new player i'm playing my uh silly i don't know rada air of kel deck or something uh i'm not the threat here that person that's playing this other really scary deck like arkham daxon they're the ones that's the threat you know is arkham daxon that scary though it is it's yes. a it's a tutor in the command zone he's <laughs> never getting something that's like uh seth he can get time sifter every game I'm just saying, you know, he's just, he's just a tutu. <laughs> and he then, you know, mono blue fast. deck, what's the worst that he can do? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Please, for the love of God. He reminds me of Captain Zami. She's just an O2 for five mana. Why would you want that? That's what I'm saying. Like, why do you even care? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, um, sorry, I don't see the video, so it's hard for me to tell when you're kidding or not. Nah, no, I'm trying to be stone-faced anyway. Uh, a couple <laughs> comments from the chat. Uh, mm-hmm. Derek said earlier, anything that tutors, draws cards, or generates super amounts of mana in your command zone is an instant alert too. Um, I think of the Ur-Dragon kind of a little bit is oh, another yeah. form of not generating mana, but generating... Well, it discounts, right? It discounts most it- of your deck. So I yeah. think that's pretty strong from the command zone. He counts as tutors. Yeah. You know, he counts as a tutor. I, I would say card advantage, not necessarily tutoring. I think you're talking about two different Ur Dragons. Not Scion. I think one of you is talking about Scoin and one of you is talking about the Ur Dragon. Oh, I, I was talking about Scion. Yeah. Yeah, Scion tutors, and that's scary. Mm-hmm. Ur Dragon himself, though, just from the command zone, discounts oh, yeah. your yeah, yeah. big dumb dragons. And he has card advantage in the sense of you do get to draw and then put down stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my bad. I thought you were talking about the other guy. <laughs> No, no, you're good. Yeah. Uh, fear of commanders and players can get old for the person, right? And that's that's kind of uh, going to lead me into another question. I would, like, what do you do when somebody comes in and they're a newer player, either to your meta or to the game, and they really want to play uh, Marin or Brago or I know uh, Valdor wanted us to throw out a plug for Narset, even though she's a yeah. commander. Why would you have to do it though? He's not here. She has all even here. He's gonna edit this audio and then yell at us, <laughs> like guys. I said Narset. What am I directing? If you guys won't listen to me, she does have the three best colors in the game. All right, you know, you know what? You <laughs> sit the point. But you know cool. what I mean, though. Like they really want to play it. Whether it's just oh, I like the art. Oh, I just think it's a cool ability. Oh, I like yeah, the colors. Yeah. You know, whatever it is. Like, mm-hmm. do you tell people? Do you take them aside and be like, look, you're going to get hated on and you're going to get annoyed with it. So this is what you do. You just go mm-hmm. balls to the wall, put the combo pieces in there and just make everybody hate you. Now, for me as a pilot, and I'm going to jump to the next perspective that we were talking about as a pilot. That's what I do for the people who are wondering in paper. I run Moldrotha. I run Edgar Markov. I run Kranko. I run what are my other two. Dota as a Super Friends deck. I can give you the top commanders on EDH rec if that helps uh, give you some... some. Re- it brings back the memories of what you're playing. <laughs> Listen here, you. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I run good commanders mm-hmm. because I, I... Me, I'm a spike player, right? So I, I mm-hmm. want to do good things. 
So for me, when I get into the pilot perspective of this is, and then even when I see other people complaining about this particular topic, which if you ever want to see this argument go, or not argument, but this topic, go on Reddit, it, the EDH subreddit, they talk about this constantly, like, oh, I get hated mm -hmm. out because I'm playing Prosh. You know, what do I do? My answer is always just run Prosh things. I don't know if you're being facetious or not here, Hacker, if you actually looked it up, because if you look at the most added commanders for this week, he literally hit four of the top five. Hey, listen Aldrota, here. 44, Edgar, 43, Prinko, 34, Joda, 31. The only one that has more votes is Atraxa. Now I really don't remember. Oh, Lord Windgrace is my other, my newest commander. That's what it is. Uh, he's Lord Windgrace too. is in the top 10. He's at 30. Well, he's brand That's new. Good. You can't hold that against me. He's new and shiny. I, I'm just saying, like, if you look at the decks, the decks that had the most new submissions over the past week, yep. you've named five of the top 10. No, because I only named five, and Krenko's one of them, and he's old. There's Krenko no way is. Krenko's yes. Krenko's yep. on there? Yes. Four new decks this week. Yes. Mm -hmm. My influence is growing. <laughs> I'm manipulating the meta of the entire format. That was so <laughs> unexpected. I was not expecting that reaction. <laughs> no, well, people honestly, should play Krenko. Krenko's a freaking awesome card. Here's, here's my only point on that. I think there's two different types of Spike players, right? There's Spike players like you, where you want to play the good stuff, even if it means that you will get focus more because you want to really some people enjoy being the arch enemy you know what i mean i built a perforous deck for that reason i wanted to be the arch enemy for whenever i played that deck i yeah. wanted everybody to go against me and like you know team up and all that stuff but yeah, do what you can I do think... people or you're gonna die there's... by turn seven <laughs> yeah uh there is another side of game. that yeah there's another side of that coin right i would consider myself partially a spike i wouldn't say it's my biggest you know personality but I see myself as Spike as I will sacrifice doing the cool stuff if it means that I tend to win more, uh, you know, in the games. And that's what I try to I aim for. So I think there's a little, there's a, you know, two different types of Spikes here. And that's okay for anybody to want to be one or the other, you know. But for me, I felt like I won more when I wasn't playing those, you know, top commanders. Um, you mentioned uh, Lord Windgrace, that he's, he's new and he's shiny. I, uh, I'm, I'm not looking forward to... Actually, I am kind of looking forward to seeing him on Magic Online. Uh, someone asked me if I would switch to him for my Jund reanimator deck because his plus two is it, I think, uh, loots, or yeah. it like draws two and discards one if you discard a land. Yep. Um, and for me, I don't think I would. I think it's just it would bring too much of that negative political atmosphere and... You know, I think for all my decks, I don't want to win on turn four or turn five because of the fact that doing that usually means that you have to bring a lot of attention to yourself. And I love the political game of kind of sneaking by and at the end winning out of nowhere. Um, I don't understand how you're talking about on what, turn eight? I was about to say, hey, I don't hey. understand how you're talking about playing Magic. Because if I remember correctly, that's not what happens. Hey, I, I just liked Sphinxes. I was playing a tribal deck. We yeah. talked about how tribal decks are janky, you know? So let's just say what we've seen from you does not exactly indicate what you're you saying about yourself. Dream Halls and Omniscience. <laughs> That's two janky cards. Tribal. That's two cards. Those are two, two very powerful two cards. cards. <laughs> two. Two cards. <laughs> Yeah, Esper uh, makes a good point too. Like he says, alternatively, if someone has an unusual commander in the command zone, think really hard about why they're playing that commander. Yeah, it's a good point. It's yeah. a good point. So, and that, that that's like what Dion was saying about me. Like, if I bring it a less the normal commander, he's still gonna be like, "Hey, wait a second, what are you trying to do with this?" Yeah. Like, yeah. you gotta think about not only the unusual commander they're bringing, but who's bringing it. Like, it's oh my god, he's bringing skeleton ship, right? Everyone's yeah. seen, a lot of us have seen, oh my god, skeleton ship, 3-H deck. It's just terrible tribal skeletons. It's just really bad. But if it's someone like me bringing skeleton ship, I'm finding some way to try to actually abuse it. Because um, mm. I don't play janky decks. So it kind of depends on who you're playing to. Like some people are, they're just, they're in it for the lulls, they're in it for the fun, and they, they make some janky decks for fun. And then there are the people who are not going to do that. So, but if somebody wants to make a janky deck with a good commander, what do you tell them? Brexit. Make a good deck with a janky commander. So don't have fun the way they want. What I'm hearing. 
I, I, my answer would be <laughs> different. I would say you can totally do that, but you have two options. Either one, play the commander that you want to play, but realize that people are going to target you very often from before you even do anything crazy, or go with a commander that you might not enjoy as much and yet have that freedom to do what the deck wants to do. So what's more important to you? Getting to see that commander that you want or getting to see the 99 cards that you want? Which one's more important? And then go from there. You know, if someone says that, oh, yeah, the commander's more important, hey, have fun. You know, that's yeah. I'm, not, I'm not gonna try to dissuade somebody from playing what they want to play. I just want to say that if your end goal is to be successful with whatever deck you make, there are a couple of things that I've seen, at least in my, I don't know, maybe eight years uh, in the format. I don't know, something like that. I don't know. It's kind of hard because, like, th that advice anyway. Because, like, Moldrotha, I guess I could play Tasker. But Even nah. Tasker is pretty See, not really Tasker, yeah. Before. Yeah. The only one in Sultai that I know of that's not like a scary uh, commander is Vorosh. You know? Now, listen here. Frexane takes that personally. No, I, I like Vorosh. Uh, I probably wouldn't play him. I'm not like too excited by his abilities. But if you play Vorosh, you're not going to be as targeted as if you played Sidisi or Tassigur or the Mimeoplasm or Damia or Muldratha. Or if you're one of those crazy people, Leovold, you know. Yeah. Not allowed, <laughs> sir. <laughs> we had a we had a conversation about this on one of the Discord servers recently. Yeah. But Vorosh also doesn't fuel any of the Moldrotha strategy that Moldrotha yeah. does. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that at that point you're basically telling them no, you can't play the grindy value recursion permanence thing. Unless you you're ready to deal it, with but... the eight. See, I mean yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just ready for it. Like yeah. if... I would start reading on my 3DH list. Tarka, Atraxa, Aurelia, Azami, Brago, Joyra, Marwin, Moldrotha, Omnath, Locus of Rage, Prosh, Rees. Like, if you hear my list, I'm like, I'm just bringing the deck I want to play. And if you guys are going to try to hate me out for it, Skithrix. I literally put Skithrix on the table one time, and one guy's like, so give us the reason you sh we shouldn't all be trying to kill you right now. And I'm like, <laughs> the only reason I can give you is that I can only infect one of you to death at one at a time. I'm like, so <laughs> as long as you aren't the first one I'm trying to infect to death, then guess what? You might have a couple more turns to answer what I'm doing. I'm like, <laughs> so I'm like, that's the only reason I could give you because literally, yes, I'm going to try to kill you all. Um, so with infect. Um, so, but I just, I mean, in the end, I think it's it's more important for me to play what I like to play. And if people are going to hate on the decks a little bit, um, that's fine. You just have to, you do have to try to build some resiliency into your decks, and it kind of encourages better deck building when you're going to mm -hmm. run into those situations. Um, Absolutely. Like better draw, better ramp, better stuff like that, so that you can handle the hate that your deck's going to take. And then most of the time, people, like at least within the 3DH meta and the EDH like communities I played within, um, they might hate your deck down to the point where you aren't doing much. But they aren't also going to kill you. Yeah. Most of the yeah, time. Yeah, it's usually one or the other. Like it's they'll either both. kill you outright because they have the way to kill you outright, or they'll just hose you down and it's like ready. leave you yeah. there and be like, okay, they're hosed down. Like like BM talked about, like kill counter or kill the Voltron commander. Oh, I've got a couple turns to deal with them now and then deal with some other stuff. That's the mm -hmm. way most like most play groups go. So if you can play it and survive that and be able to draw back in and say, okay, well, now I'm back, I'm representing the threat, then you just got to build a little bit more resiliency into your decks if you know you're going to be taking some of that, like, Githrix yeah. is going to draw removal yeah. and going to draw hate. Yeah. I think. Would um, you say that... Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to give my own answer to my question, because mm -hmm. I know I asked you guys, but I should obviously give my own answer. For me, I tell people that if you're not willing to play the good degen de de degenerate things, then you're probably not ready to play that deck. Uh, Krenko is probably my biz biggest example when I talk to people, is that like when my meta says my, sees my Krenko deck, they know that I'm trying to win before anybody else has a chance to do anything. And I've had games where I was the arch enemy on the table, and they've done their best to stop me, and I win eventually because either they couldn't kill me before I comboed out, or I just comboed out. And people are right, like, well, right. why do you play that? Is that fun for you? And I'm like, yeah, it, it's a challenge. One, I like challenges. So that's that's one thing. 
it's a challenge to play because everybody wants to kill me. It's a challenge for me to just pilot the deck because there's so many combos in it. I have to remember them all. And Mm -hmm. I don't play it often enough where I would say I know everything by heart. And I don't always like, sometimes I draw a card and I look at them like, all right, what do you do again? Because I know you do something. (laughs) Like, I know you're a combo piece, but what do you do and what do you do it with? Um, you're in here for a reason. <laughs> you win the game somehow. How do I get to that point? It's uh, like uh, but, uh, Dream Halls, right? No. Dream, I'm pretty sure <laughs> most people know what Dream Halls is going to do so when like, it comes how, out. How do I use this early harvest in Wart? How does that work? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, so... It kind of tests me as a pilot. Um, and just at the end of the day, I just, every once in a while, I want to, to prove that I can, I guess. Fight the hate. Yeah. Like, I think, I think I'm a competitive person, even in like a personality mentality, where like every once in a while, it's like, I want to prove that if I really wanted to stomp people into the dust, I'm going to bring this deck and stomp you into the dust, turn four. Yeah. For, oh, yeah. Maybe yeah. that makes me a big jerk. It probably does. <laughs> But and Esper, like, Esper makes a good point on that. He says, just remember, if you're breaking out that sword deck, sometimes you're going to frustrate your friends if you constantly win, and they might be angry if you stop playing with you. Because so we, that's, we, yeah. we, you, you definitely have to walk that tightrope of a line where you're, mm-hmm. you're trying to play to the community that you're in. And I yeah. think you're talking about pulling out Krenko to stomp people to be like, hey, I can do this, but now let's play some fun stuff yeah. too. Typically, Krenko is a once a week thing. Like when I used to have weekly meetups with uh, Danny and I used to have uh, weekly meetups, I would play it once in a great while, like once a month maybe. Right, or if right. I was on like a losing, like a, a big wave of losing, like game after game after game, or like having decks that I was trying out and they weren't working out the way I wanted to or whatever. I would break out crank up and be like, I just need to know that I can play I can this game. Like, yeah, I need to know that I'm actually good at this game. Let's see if I can still do this. And uh, I remember one time I was playing my food chain prosh deck and I messed up because I just didn't pay attention. And somebody had an untapped Nev's disc out. Ooh. And they basically waited for me to do whatever I want to do, went to combat and said, yeah, I'm going to blow away your field. And I was like, I just concede because it's so bad. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to play Krenko. And they're like, you went from Prost to Krenko? What are you doing? He's like, no, you don't understand. I have to know that I'm not stupid. So I'm going to play <laughs> Krenko to prove it to myself because that was just the most idiotic thing because I sat there and I stared at the guy who was a friend of mine. He was across the table and I stared at him like, didn't you just put that out? And he's like, no, it's been out for a turn, man. And everybody was like, yeah, he played it two turns ago. And I looked around and I'm like, I concede. Like, I'm just out of this game because I don't deserve to sit at this table right now because I'm just uh, blatantly an idiot. Or, or maybe you forget to equip a Swift Boot Boots. Oh my god, that stupid <laughs> dragon. <laughs> we talked about it in paper that wouldn't have happened. All right, that was our, one of our last stream games. I tried to play a dragon deck and I had a way to kill the person who had infinite on the table and then I didn't do it. Stupid. Because mm. he forgot to equip his Swift Boot Boots before combat. Because Such a noob. Oh, wouldn't happen in paper. We'd have been like, oh, I'm walking back. We talked about this. It's going to happen. Yeah. I went to combat and like looked at the card, and on screen, my face just fell. I was like, this poor dragon. He's got four feet, but two of them are now cold, because I didn't put the boots on him. You know, Crimson <laughs> Wanderer here brings up a, an interesting question. Uh, they say, I thought Atraxa is the reason Infect is now busted. If someone's playing an Infect deck, and I know, Frixion, you mentioned uh, Scytherix, He's still but if someone's, if someone's playing uh, <laughs> if someone's playing an Infect deck, and you can tell that they are when they put their first Infect creature, is that a reason to target them from like the beginning of that game? I had someone uh, in a game this week, they were playing Hapatra, so they got down uh, mm, I think Hapatra. it's Frixian Juggernaut, and someone said, I can't believe you're playing Infect. Uh, and I can't remember if they either scooped or they like just targeted them from the rest of the game. Is that like another thing to keep in mind when it comes to like the threat assessment? Like the type of deck you're playing? Only, yeah, yeah. I think I think you have to be aware of what you're weak to. But so Infect isn't that strong of, of, of a strategy. I get the whole yeah, like, oh it's it's half of command damage, blah blah blah, and it's only a quarter of your life. But they have to hit you. Like, why are you letting people hit you? 
Honestly, I feel like Infect is very strong when it comes to making people lose, but it's very weak when it comes to making people win. The Infect player eh, doesn't, re doesn't really win that often, yeah. but they do make people lose very quickly. Typically, so one I wouldn't person. say that it's strong. Yeah, just one person, and they die. usually how it goes. Maybe that's another reason to not be the scariest person at the table, because there always, might be someone playing Infect. Yeah, I'm always amazed when Infect players even kill people. I'm like, why did you let it get to this point? <laughs> like, like, especially if I'm running the Infect, like, I, I run Hapatra, and I put Triumph of the Hordes in the deck, and then people are like, oh, well, you're a jerk because you killed everybody with Infect. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This is your fault. Why didn't you stop me? <laughs> like, yeah. You guys yeah. all know I like Triumph of the Hordes. It's one of my favorite cards in Magic. Like, why do you let me do this? I mean, there's a bunch of good ones. Blightseal Colossus is another Infect card that really can kill people quickly. Uh, in a in one hit if they don't have blockers or if they only have a one one blocker. Yeah. Or you can yeah. just be a really terrible person and you know play Lazav and find ways to do it from your grave. All right, listen here. Oh yeah. Ooh, I, what I about? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you haven't you haven't heard this, the card I was going to mention yet, um, uh, Seth. What about that five drop enchantment that gives the enchanted creature infect and also you get to take control of creatures from your opponent's side. What about that guy? Corrupted, Corrupted conscience. conscience. Yeah. Yeah. You're only talking about this because it's a steel card. Uh, uh, that's a secondary effect, I think. Uh, I don't think it is. <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> is Bushcrafty in this chat? Is he watching with a big old smile of, hey, oh, hey, hey, I'd love that. Man, I sure hope so. Ooh, Tainted Strike. That's another good one from uh, DP Cross. But that, here's the thing. I don't actually have any Infect decks just because I don't know how I can make it strong enough to to uh, play. Well, Tainted Although Strike goes really good with one commander. You know that, right? Which one? Yargle. Who? Yargle. Oh, Yargle. Yep. Yeah. He's Yargle. already he's already got nine power. You give him one more yeah. and give him Infect and boom, you're dead. I should have put it in my Leecha deck, honestly. I think it would have been solid there. Maybe that and Hatred. Hatred's another good one. I don't know. I Frexen, I, 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 so much. Yeah. Rexon, I feel like you're probably in the same mindset as me, though, of like, if I kill you with Infect, it's, it's not my fault, it's yours. Oh, it really is. Like, yeah. And I, I, think, I think the way that I've made Infect playable, like, is, is by basically combining the concept of Infect and Voltron. That's basically what, what I did with Scytherix, is it's like, hey, I'm really not running that many Infect creatures in Scytherix. I'm just running ways to ramp them out fast and some ways to make them really huge, and I'm going to beat your face in with Scytherix. And I'm going to be able to recast them if you happen to be able to kill them. Um, yeah. And I can't regenerate them. <laughs> but that and I think that that's one of the ways to make it viable is then because essentially then you are talking about oh I'm playing Voltron but I'm playing 10 instead of 21 and then it makes it a lot more doable but if you are playing infect as an overall strategy uh it's really hard to get you know 30 infect damage on three people if they're actually interacting with your board and they're actually blocking your creatures it's just really hard to do yeah yeah I like What's Esper Derek's comment in the chat. I honestly fear that is it players sitting there doing nothing over guy trying to kill new players one at a time. So when I first read your comment, I thought you said at the same time. I don't know how my brain did that in chat because that's not what it says at all when you look at it with your eyes. Um, with your eyeballs. <laughs> with your eyeballs. But <laughs> my instant re reply thinking that you were saying at the same time was that's what the is it player's trying to do. He's trying to kill everybody all at one time. You just haven't seen it yet. Yeah. But. Yeah. So I, I kind of notice when it comes to this topic, you guys definitely are more along the sides of, you know, if someone's playing a, a strong commander, but they're not necessarily playing a strong deck, that it's kind of good to not, not, I don't know how to, how to word this without s sounding wrong, but to not focus so much on what the commander does as much as on what the deck does, as opposed to me, where I definitely keep that in mind, the, the commander itself. Um, do you think, for example, if I were at a table sitting with one of you guys and you were playing Prosh or you were playing Krenko, well, maybe Krenko's not a good example, but let's say I was, you were playing one of these decks and I tried to get the table to go up against you as much as possible, would you feel like that was unfair? I always assume that... I'm going to be probably one of the biggest targets at the table because of the way I play. 
Mm. Especially when playing with people I know. So if I if I if I sit down at a table with Danny or even with just John, I expect one or both of them to tell the rest of the table to kill me first. Mm-hmm. If they don't, they're worried I'm gonna win the game. Because that's Yeah, but when you make new plays like not equipping a Listen here. Are you okay? really that scary? <laughs> <laughs> I'm never gonna let you live it down. Oh, that's great. You know, in paper, I play this game a lot better. Just so everybody <laughs> understands. But you, play with... you can't misclick in paper. Yeah. Yeah. You can't misclick in paper. Well, you can. You know, but you, you just can, run it back. Can like you can, JB's you can still shuffling in paper. Wink, wink. <laughs> you can still, oh, God, you can please. still go to oh, combat in paper without equipping. But you can be like, oh wait, I would obviously equip my boots first because we just talked about it. Yeah. It's not mechanically or technologically possible in MTGO. But yeah. what I like to say when I when I play paper, I like to say to the play group, let's pretend for a moment that I'm not an idiot and that I put this on before going to combat. That's what I like to say. Or like I tap my mana yeah. right or something. Like and then some the person who's mistake. going to die says, "Nope, can't pretend you are an idiot." <laughs> <laughs> nope, I, you are 100 percent stupid right now. It's it's not a question. It's not. It's, the thing. it's not a question. <laughs> you can't answer with no. Uh, but yeah. I really, uh, I really enjoy this topic. I still, I still uh, like to see everybody's perspective on it because everybody has a different way that they play commander, right? Nobody, no two people will play the exact same way. One person might like boom pile like me. Another person might say it's complete garbage. You know, like everybody else, like everybody I mean, else. <laughs> I'm kind of like on the on your question though about mm-hmm. like, am I going to be annoyed if I'm getting targeted because of the commander I'm playing? Mm-hmm. It kind of depends. If I'm playing a commander that just gets nutty out of nowhere and can just win the game, like, let's say Joyra, that's mm-hmm. just sitting on the table. The old one or the new one? Or both? The new one. New one. New one. The new one. And then, but all of a sudden can, you know, with a couple cards, draw me my entire deck and just win the game on the, like, like literally out of nowhere, then I'm not going to feel bad if I'm getting targeted because, yes, Joyra needs to be removed every single time you can remove her. Um, because she, if she's sitting on the table, I can just win with that deck regardless. So right. I get that. But if I'm sitting, if I'm playing a strong commander like Moldrotha, like some other stuff, that yeah, it's a very strong commander. It does things, but it requires setup. Like Moldrotha requires you to have stuff in your graveyard to right. be really good and really effective. Moldrotha mm-hmm. requires you know to be on the field. Um, mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, you're playing Moldrotha. Like, from turn one now, I'm going to target you and I'm going to kill you because you're playing Moldrotha. Hmm. I have a problem with that, you know? I guess more than anything else. Like, because you're playing this commander, I'm going to target you and do everything I can to kill you because of this Hmm. commander. Yeah. Like, so I guess it's kind of different based off of, like, is it a combo-y commander that can just, like, boom, I win the game out of nowhere? Or is it Hmm. one of those commanders that requires setup that can lock the game out, but you don't have to, like, be oh, I'm going to do everything I can to ruin your night, you know? Yeah, yeah. There is think, there is a, a definitely a little bit of balance that you have to have. You can't just say, okay, well, anything above a certain number, they're my primary. T-. You know, sometimes yeah. you have to be more wary at the table. Even though Unesh is not played very often, you know, that's definitely something you can think of as a pretty scary commander. Only you know? when Omniscience and Dream Falls are With Lab Mania. So um, Lab, I do yeah. I do want to make a comment that I don't know if we talked about even on the stream before, but I feel like people who target you based on what your commander can potentially do, and I want to use your Moldrosa example, Frexing, as kind of where I'm going with this, I, I feel like that's admittance that you basically have no way of dealing with me otherwise. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, if somebody says, oh, you're playing Moldrosa, so that's going to be a constant problem, blah, blah, you basically just admitted that you don't put enough great hate in your deck. Which I think is, I think that's the more annoying part for me. It's like if you, so if you brewed your deck better, you would be more confident in playing against me. But because of your, you know, not being prepared, you're gonna basically ruin, try to mess with me, even though I could potentially not have done anything if you just put Bajuka Bog in your damn deck. You know, yeah, what I, mean? I. I... I tend to think of uh, what's that desert one that does kind of something similar. I Cabbage tend to run grass. that almost. Yeah, that one. I tend to run that a lot too because it's, it's always good to have some way to find, uh, you know, some graveyard hate. 
Well, yeah, and that's my so, point. Everybody should run yeah. a little bit of answers for everything. And if it's in a you know more structured meta or a more mm -hmm. constant meta, then you definitely need to be running those answers. And when I see people come up, especially like especially on stream, if I'm on stream and I'm playing a deck with black in it, and you don't come with some kind of grave paint in your deck, and then you try to kill me because you don't have grave paint in your deck, I'm basically like, so you came to this stream completely ill prepared. Like, what, what do you think? That is the preparation, though. But what, what do you think I do to here? Kill you is the prep. Well, yeah, but you shouldn't just come with the intention to hate out one player, though. Well, that's not, that's I, not I agree. Good, that's not good preparation. Yeah, I don't think it's good to have that plan B, you know, be your plan A. I had uh, Baru, Fist of Krosa, and that was kind of the idea behind the deck was all my answers are going to be removing the player that controls them or owns the permanents that are a problem. And it didn't really work out for me. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, some people, that's, that's what they do. And it's not a great answer, but if someone is lacking, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, but I'm kind of coming up short let's say someone is playing perforous right and they don't have any ways to remove enchantments then yeah it makes sense to try to remove the player uh, as opposed to the enchantment but if you don't have graveyard hate with you know scavenging grounds being colorless yeah. and expedition map being colorless that you can have two cards in your deck that you can always either get something that is graveyard hate or just is graveyard hate um, i feel like it's pretty easy to yeah. just stick it in every deck at least that's what i'm doing there's it's, it's there's colorless me. ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. At least five that I could rattle off the top of my head. Between Scavenger Grounds, Tormont's Crypt, the mm -hmm. Crook of Condemnation? Condemnation? Yep, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Those are, what was that, just three? Yeah, yeah. You've got uh, Relic of Progenitus as well. Yep. And then there and then was one more. One more. Torpor, uh, not Torpor Orb. Uh, Tormod's Crypt, that's the one. No, that was the first one I said. This just in, Scavenger Rounds has actually dropped a very 3DH playable, which I didn't realize. I just well, just in general, it. like, Three cents. even even in EDH, like, there's no way you shouldn't run Grave Hate. Well, there's I agree. no I'm way. Just, I'm saying for all our 3DH players out there, now we have that option. Because Scavenger Grounds was, like, expensive for a utility line. Now it's three. So. It cycled out of standard, is that right? Or no? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably what happened. But first of all, stop telling people to ruin my shit. <laughs> Second of all, listen here, you. <laughs> you were no, just she... telling that to people that they should pack graveyard hate, and suddenly Freaks and Walker says <laughs> the exact same thing, and you get mad at him. What is going on, sir? No, no, no. I'm talking about EDH. He's talking about 3DH. Completely opposite yes. things. Hey, they're both games that you can play. That you okay. should be running. I just like to give Frex in a hard time. Okay, look, he called me. <laughs> hey, hey, it's fine. I just know that now this is added to my list: Tectonic Edge, Ghost Quarter, and Scavenger Grounds. And yeah, every single awesome. land base I build. <laughs> exactly. It's great. Like, I that's, love it. that's the same kind of thing, though. You have answers for any kind of land in all your decks. That's the same concept. You should have answers for the graveyard in all your decks, unless you're playing me. In which case, leave it alone. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, planar yeah. void. Everyone should just play planar void in their decks with black in it. I don't know what that does. It's a it's a one drop uh, enchantment. Oh, I think. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. It's I've like seen it. this before. I have not thought about this card in a very long time. I mean, I think if if you don't know what graveyard hate to play, relic of progenitus is a pretty good place to start because it's always it's also a cantrip on it. You know, so if you need to. Cash it in for another card draw. Go ahead. Like, there's no graveyard hit at the table. Sweet. Cash it in. You know? I like the land, personally, since I don't have to run a non-land card. I can run more stuff for my theme. Popper but, stable you know. relic of progenitus, yes. <laughs> how, how expensive really... is it? Uh, because it's played in, like, almost every popper deck online, it's actually kind of expensive. Ooh. I, I do I like Crook of Condemnation, though, because it's cheap. It can hit mm -hmm. single cards, and it's, like, repeatable in that aspect, so that, you know, hey, the graveyard player goes to target something in his graveyard, you just get rid of it. And mm -hmm. it has that oh shit button of one and exile it. You don't have to tap it and get rid of all graveyards at once. So if they try to, like, bait you by getting rid of the one card, you can then, and then they try to, like, target something else, or they try to living death after that, you can then basically be like, oh, nope, you're not getting it. You know what yeah, I mean? I, I like that it's versatile like that. Mm-hmm. Bitbots has a copy for 73 cents now. What? It's a lot more yeah. card hoarder. 
Relic? Yeah. Oh, shit. 73 cents? And goat bots, yeah. You. For a common. You. That's so much. Why do you let it be that much, Magical Hacker? I, I actually said here, I, th I said, hey, that's not bad. But, but for <laughs> not 72 3DH. cents is a lot. For, for yeah, 3DH, yeah. For 3DH, yeah. What are you talking yeah. about? That's hey, over sir. 20%. <laughs> Did I do it, math teacher? Did I do it, Dad? <laughs> um, sure. I said over twenty percent at seventy-three of a three-dollar deck. Yes, you, you, it, it is correctly to say that it is over. I admit my mistake. Okay, I'm not. I'm, you, not I'm not. I'm not. Let's just say it's playing. nearly twenty-five. It's two cents off being twenty-five. percent I wanted to say twenty-five, and then I thought you were going to quick math me and be like, "It's actually twenty-four point three percent, sir." I was going to be like, "Well, shit, there it goes." But are you proud of me, Dad? Yeah, you did good. Thanks, Dad. For some reason, Crutchin Walker is going to be backyard? Dad now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> are you guys going to go play catch in the backyard, or what's going on? Uh, it's going to be a long game of catch. I can't throw all the way down to North Carolina, I think. <laughs> yeah, North Carolina. It's okay. You can just Amazon it to me, and then I'll Amazon it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be an expensive game of catch. But that's pretty awesome. On that note, I think I think we've gotten some good ideas out. So ending yeah. comments is it is my general consensus for this topic is if you want to play a good commander, you better be able to deal with the hate, which means be have a good deck. Like you want to build janky stuff, do it to a point, but do not sacrifice the strength of the deck in order to try to have janky fun because then you're gonna wind up being miserable. That's that's my problem. Uh, as far as the rest of the table, because then everybody's return argument is, well, if you play too strong of a commander, everybody else is miserable. That's up to the rest of the table to build decks that can compete with mine. I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't. I cannot build the decks for the other people. That is that is my honest to god mentality. I can't make you play better magic, but I can try to convince you by kicking the crap out of you, maybe once or twice. Wow. What, what would, would you say you? is your like summary, Frixian? Play the commander you want to play, but be willing to accept others' opinions of that commander and what they're going to do to you for playing it. Yeah. So you're you're more of a just understand that sometimes you're you're gonna get the crap kicked out of you. Yeah, understand. That sometimes you're gonna get the crap kicked out of you, and sometimes you're gonna kick the crap out of other people with that commander. <laughs> That's the dream. All right, hacker. What about you? What are, what are your thoughts? I mean, if I had to summarize it, I'd say this. If you want to do the crazy stuff that you can do with the really powerful commanders, um, in my opinion, I think you're going to be sacrificing the win rate uh, in doing so. If you want to win a lot of commanders, for me personally, it's a lot easier to do that by choosing to play a commander that people aren't going to be afraid of right off the bat. So play what you want to play. Uh, know the results of you know the threat assessment that's going to happen because of that, and plan ahead. If you want to have a successful deck doing, let's say, for example, for me, I wanted to do Jund Reanimator. I chose to go with Zira Arian over Lord Windgrace, you know, and that yeah. I think helps me be more successful with the deck. Um, actually, I can definitely say that helped me be more successful with the deck, you know. So that's my that's my two cents. Real quick, just a addendum. My comments for the record, just because Magical Hacker brought up win rates, I don't always care that I, I'm not a spike player in the fact that I have to win every game, but my oh, deck yeah, has to no, perform no. well. Mm -hmm. I just don't mm -hmm. want people to get it mixed up like my idea is, oh, go for the win every time. No, I want to build my decks in a way that they're going to be able to play even with the hate. So if you hate me out of a game and I lose, that's fine, as long as I got to do something. Games where I sit there and do nothing because my deck's not built properly or oh, built well that's enough. That's the worst. Yeah, that's that's what I'm fighting against. Don't mm. sit there and have a miserable time because you brought a too strong commander and you couldn't handle the hate, and then you just sat there and were miserable. That's what I don't want. Build it strong enough yeah. to where you are at least going to have plays. Whether you win or lose, have some plays where hopefully that yeah. I would imagine that's the fun part for everybody is getting to do some cool stuff in the game. Whether you win or lose... Yeah. You want your deck to perform well. You want to know that your your idea worked out in your head. Yeah. Put that time sifter on the pro prototype portal and make like five of them. You know, do something fun. Why would you do that? <laughs> I, maybe I like to see the world burn with my 
colorless shenanigans. You know what? Right of replication on that time stream navigator. Kick it with uh, swarm intelligence out. <laughs> What's the worst oh, that could sounds, happen? Sounds beautiful. It sounds beautiful. I've lived that dream. Honestly, I feel like maybe I should do the time sifter prototype portal thing, and I should play Arkham Daxon in like 3DH if I can. I obviously, I have to look at the prices and uh, and uh, have some fun with that. What do you think about that? <laughs> I mean, again, right of replication kicked. I'm sure oh, okay. <laughs> form intelligence. I'm already convinced that I'm a terrible person because then I sat there and was like, "If you guys don't kill me, I'm gonna actually take all these turns." And I, and they conceded. That was the only reason why I didn't get to take all the turns. Um, mm. All right, so that's gonna be it for this week. Uh, those were our final thoughts. I think I think we're kind of all in the same range, yeah. even though we tweaked it. Everybody tweaked it a little bit differently based on yeah, 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 uh, personality types. I think. Uh, of course, make sure you guys are following us on twitch.tv slash printermagic. For those of you who are going to listen to the, the audio for this later, make sure you, I think, favorite us on Libsyn and Spotify. And for those of you watching the video later, make sure you uh, like, comment, and subscribe to the channel there. You can follow us on twitter.com slash printermagic, facebook.com slash printermagic, and join us in the Discord via the link that will be in the descriptions down below, whether it's audio or video. And... Magical Hacker, you have a bunch of social media and some resources out there on Tapped Out. Yeah. If you want to go ahead oh, and talk yeah. about those, uh, my Tapped Out profile is Magical Hacker, all one word. You can find all my uh, of staple effects. So if you're looking to find some more card draw, or you're trying looking to find some more tutors, or what have you, if you're trying to find some more pillow fort, right? This is uh, what Seth wants to find more of every day. I hate uh, you. you can go to. <laughs> You can go to my uh, tap out profile right there on that page. You'll find, I think it's all 17 or 18 lists. Um, I have to double check on my number. I update it with each set. I've been kind of lazy and I haven't updated it in a while, but there you can find it. If you're interested in the EDH gameplay that I do, I have a YouTube channel. It's Magical Hacker MTG, or you can just search it up as The Blood Hall and you'll find it there. Um, and then what else? Reddit. I go on Reddit occasionally. Uh, Twitter is magical underscore underscore hacker. I talk about some stuff that I'm doing, including a giveaway. I'm doing a live stream game this coming Wednesday. Got a lot of stuff going on. So join us for some fun. Yeah. Have, have, let's have a good time. And of course, we'll make sure that all the links to everything for him is down in the description below, whether it's video, audio. Frexion, where can we find you on social media? I don't do social media. You can find me on the Discord. I don't have extra resources. I am the resource. He is oh, the, he is the so, hidden. You can't find him on social media. He's hidden. You, uh, you you must come. You must come to me on the Discord. But if you do, I will bestow as much of my wisdom as I can. Bestow the you. mechanic? You're gonna enchant people? <laughs> the jokes you know don't what? get any better than this. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I I like it. I just I'm thinking <laughs> of it like Skithrix with bestow. That's him. He's Skithrix with bestow. Ugh. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, so fun. for the rest of this week, I should be streaming uh, Wednesday and Friday back to 3DH. We took a break last week because of the holiday and family visitors. Uh, next Monday, we'll be having another reflection of the council up until the 17th. And I, I do want to make a point of saying that uh, the 17th will be the last one for the year, the calendar year. We're going to take a break for everybody to go and do their holiday stuff and family stuff. And we'll start either the second... Monday, I th I think it's the second Monday of January is when I want to start back up. But I'll, I'll get those more concrete dates of when we start back up for next Monday. But yeah, the seventeenth of December is going to be the last one for the year. So just so you guys know, you're going to have a couple weeks without reflection. Sorry, but we all have to travel and do stuff. So seventeenth, uh, we're also going to have a guest, which I'm excited about. I'm not going to tell you who it is though. Whoa. It's not me. <laughs> No, but I you're gonna be here for that one, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just I just won't be the guest. Okay. I mean you're always a guest, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We always well, welcome you I, I into guess. the council. And then we keep yes, it ready. But, yes. I'm I'm fired every week and I'm hired again. I don't know why they keep hiring me. But uh man issues. <laughs> <laughs> but all right guys. Hopefully you guys enjoy Godor's dead, that's why. Yeah, that's <laughs> You know, hey, you know why Valdor's dead, but he can still direct us? Because the two Golgari mages keep bringing him back. Oh. Full circle. I like Full that. Full circle. And with that, cool. we just didn't. Merit. <laughs>
So hopefully you guys enjoyed the stupidity that is Reflections of the Council this Monday. We will see you guys next Monday for Reflections and again streaming Wednesday and Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern time from now on. All the streams are 9 p.m. No more 8.30 because that messed us all up. 9 p.m. streams. See you guys on Wednesday. Peace. Take care.